Good afternoon. On today's Angry Alien Bulletin, as many of you have probably heard, the WOW signal may have been identified as being a very rare but natural phenomenon. And even though we are not going to go into great detail as to what specifically was discovered about the WOW signal, instead we are going to talk about another signal that could not have been created by the same natural phenomena. As a matter of fact, no known natural phenomena could have possibly created this signal, which was discovered 20 years ago and then promptly forgotten, even though it repeated all of this and more. Coming at you on the Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon. Once again, welcome to another Angry Alien Bulletin. We are going to be talking about another wow signal or something very similar to that signal, something that bears a great deal of resemblance to the types of signals that SETI has been looking for for decades that would correspond to the types of signals we would expect to receive from an advanced interstellar civilization. So why is this signal particularly interesting and why was the original wow signal interesting only to be later identified as an extremely unusual but completely natural astronomical event well I'm gonna be very brief about the wow signal its discovery and why we no longer think it originated from an artificial source the wow signal was an extremely powerful narrow band radio signal Signal detected in August of 1977 that could not be explained by any natural phenomena that we were familiar with at the time. And as the years went on, terrestrial explanations for this signal, some sort of background interference or misidentified transmission from a terrestrial source, all of these explanations fell flat. And the only explanation that made any sense until recently was a trans transmission from an artificial source, an extremely powerful transmission from a civilization capable of creating an enormous amount of energy. We're talking the total energy output of our entire planet to produce this type of signal. And for some reason, they directed this narrowband transmission our way and yet it never repeated. This was the thing that astronomers were always suspicious about when it came to the wow signal. If you're going to devote that much energy and that much in the way of resources in directing such a powerful signal towards a promising star with a promising planet orbiting inside its Goldilocks zone, then why would you only send the signal once? And we looked for the signal quite a number of times, although to be fair, not nearly comprehensive comprehensively enough to rule out the possibility that it could have repeated while we weren't looking, but because it never repeated, SETI never regarded it as being a genuine signal. And this has been the case actually for quite a number of signals that we have detected over the years. So why the sudden change? How did they figure out that this was a natural phenomenon rather than an artificial signal? Well, before we get into that, we need to talk about what SETI has been looking for for all these years. First of all, we expect radio signals that have an artificial origin are going to come in a narrow band type of signal. Broadband transmissions consume entirely too much power and are just unnecessary. Narrow band transmissions make a lot more sense and also they tend to only come from artificial sources. There are very, very few natural sources that produce narrow band signals. But if an extraterrestrial civilization were to transmit towards a promising planet, what frequency would they use? Well, astronomers have determined probably very accurately that they would transmit at a frequency that corresponds to something that everybody would understand. And the most obvious one is to transmit at a frequency that corresponds to the frequency
efficiency generated by molecular hydrogen. Since hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, that is something that every advanced civilization should be familiar with. And so virtually all of the studies that have been implemented looking for extraterrestrial transmissions have focused either on this signal or some signal with a mathematical formula associated with it, such as 1400 megahertz times pi, 1400 megahertz being roughly the correct signal for molecular hydrogen. Multiply that by pi, and that's a concept that every advanced civilization should understand as well. Or the square root of 1400 megahertz. There's a variety of different possibilities that make a great deal of sense, although a signal directly associated with hydrogen is the most obvious one, and that's what the wow signal actually was a narrowband, very powerful signal that corresponded to molecular hydrogen almost exactly. But here's the problem. This signal also corresponds to natural signals that are put out by objects that have a lot of hydrogen in them, such as hydrogen clouds between the stars. However, these signals are not very powerful and not always narrow band. As a matter of fact, they're almost never narrow band. But there are certain phenomena when they pass through hydrogen clouds that that actually create narrow band signals that correspond to the signal generated by molecular hydrogen by sheer coincidence. Again, this is not a very common thing, but it's something we have observed elsewhere in the universe. After extensive research, recent research, it's been determined that wow signals actually come from all over the universe, just not as powerful as the 1977 wow signal. So it was later hypothesized that an extremely powerful narrow band phenomena known as a maser generated by something called a magnetar, a particularly energetic type of neutron star, if it passed through a conveniently placed hydrogen cloud, could create a signal very similar to that of the wow signal. And as a matter of fact, there is a hydrogen cloud roughly in the area of space where the wow signal came from that is moving at just the right velocity to change the signal slightly. Remember when I said that the wow signal was almost exactly at the same frequency as molecular hydrogen? Well, what changes the signal slightly is something called Doppler shifting. In other words, the object generating the signal, or in this case, the object between us and the signal, is traveling in a velocity velocity relative to the Earth that would change the signal slightly as the result of a Doppler shift. And interestingly enough, this Doppler shift exactly corresponds to the Doppler shift that was observed with the wow signal. That is far too big of a coincidence to have happened by chance. Now to be clear, this situation is far from case closed. An artificial narrowband signal passing through that same hydrogen cloud would also also create the same phenomena, the same characteristics that we have observed in the wow signal. So it's not impossible that this is a narrow band signal from an artificial source, but the natural signal makes a whole lot more sense until it repeats. That's the big factor. If this signal were ever to repeat at the same signal strength, the same frequency coming from the same region of space, the natural explanation would fall flat on its face. If you're interested in more details as to why that's the case and why, unfortunately, this recent discovery, in my opinion, is going to make the search for extraterrestrial signals that much more difficult in the future, I will be releasing a far more detailed video on the subject on my Patreon channel tomorrow. Okay, so what about this other wow signal? What makes it different? How do we know that this one doesn't have a natural explanation? Well, first of all, one thing that's made this signal far less popular and far less likely to be repeated in the popular press is its name. Not very sexy. SHGBO2 plus 14A. 
Let me say that again. SHGB02 plus 14A. Not very exciting at all. But it was detected in March of 2003. It stirred up a little bit of attention in the press when a publication called New Scientist talked about it on September 1st of 2004. And then after that, it appears to have been forgotten almost completely. It was detected by Oliver Velker of Logpoint in Nuremberg, Germany, and Nate Collins of Farron and Associates in Wisconsin, the United States. Now, why people like this in such widely disparate locations? Well, it's because it was part of a service called SETI at Home, where you downloaded a screensaver to your laptop, computer, whatever, and by using the processing power of your computer combined with the processing power of computers around the world and utilizing the data gathered by the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. So at this point, this project is a little hindered by the fact that that telescope is no longer functional. SETI at home would sift through millions of signals detected by the Arecibo telescope looking for signals that appeared promising. And these two gentlemen found a signal in the same region of space that appeared to be transmitting on a narrow band at the right frequency, 1420 megahertz, so a little off the hydrogen line, but that can be expected as a result of Doppler shifting. But here's the key thing. It was detected three times in the space of one minute. In other words, it repeated the one feature that SETI scientists have been looking for for decades, and this signal had it. It was narrow band. It appeared to be coming from space. It was the right frequency and it repeated. However, there were some other features of the signal that led SETI experts to become very skeptical about it, and in my opinion, their reasoning is flawed to say the least. First of all, the source is located between the constellations of Pisces and Aries, a direction in which very few stars have been observed within a thousand light years from Earth, meaning that this signal either came from very, very far away, or it didn't come from from a solar system that we can observe. Is this inconsistent with an advanced technology? No, it absolutely isn't. But let's go ahead and go on. It's a very weak signal. Once again, though, something that we could expect if it were coming from a very significant distance. And also, if we were to send a signal to a target a thousand light years away, utilizing the types of power that we have at our disposal, well, it would be a pretty weak signal as well. As a matter of fact, virtually all the radio signals that have ever been emanated from our planet tend to vanish to complete invisibility against cosmic background noise in a hundred light years or less. So weak signals should not be that big of a surprise. But there's something else that's very strange about this signal. It has a rapid drift changing by between 8 and 37 hertz per second. So a crazy Doppler shift if that is indeed what it is. This would indicate an emission coming from a planet rotating nearly 40 times faster on its axis than the Earth. This also made the signal invalid as far as most SETI observers were concerned. But once again, just because it's rotating that fast doesn't mean that it isn't valid. It could simply be coming from an artificial target that's rotating that fast. And by the way, rotating 40 times faster on its axis than the Earth would exactly correspond to the type of rotation that we would expect to see from a space station or a large spaceship generating artificial gravity for its passengers. And incidentally, just because there's very few stars in the region that the signal came from doesn't mean there are no stars in this region. As a matter of fact, the star G73-11A in B, which is a binary star, is 106.1 light years away from the sun, and another star called called G73-10 is 108.7 light years away. Less than three light years away, by the way, from the G73-11A in B stars. What if we had an interstellar ship 
going between these two star systems. Keep in mind, only three light years apart. If it's an advanced interstellar civilization, we would expect them to be traveling between these two star systems. And all of these stars are red dwarfs, much less massive than the sun, but that doesn't mean that they don't have planetary systems capable of supporting life. And all of this assumes that we're not talking about an advanced civilization that doesn't require a solar system. And machine civilizations definitely fit into that category. Now, there's another star, L1159-16, which is actually one of the nearest 40 stars to the sun. It's relatively close to the signal's position, but probably not the right star. It's not close enough to the signal's point of origin to make sense. But still, there are stars in the region that fit the bill. So the big question is, why is this not being explored more thoroughly? Well, the simple reason is SETI and organizations like it are not getting the necessary funding to follow up on anything, regardless of how promising it might be. We haven't searched for any evidence of this star repeating since its original detection. And now that Arecibo has been destroyed, it's going to make the task even more challenging. And here's the worst part. The WOW signal, if it had repeated, would have almost certainly been the first solid and indisputable detection of extraterrestrial civilizations that we have ever found. And yet, no effort has been made to look for a repeat of the WOW signal since 1999. At no time this century has anybody thought that it was worth looking for a repeat of this famous signal, just because nobody can get the dish time necessary. Now granted, many efforts were made Made since its discovery to try to pick up a repeat, but it was far from comprehensive. And now that we found a compelling natural explanation for WOW, I think it's very unlikely that we're ever going to look for a repeat, not only from this signal, but from others. Because at this point, the predominating theory is going to be, even if we can't find a natural explanation for a signal that we detect, as artificial as it might appear. If we just wait another 50 years, we'll surely come up with a natural explanation. So why bother looking at it any further? Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I would like to thank the following incredible people, Eric Fielding, Jonathan Lind, Meet Lacat, and Derek Sutherland, my latest Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for helping me out. Your support keeps this content coming. I really appreciate it. And if you'd like to join these folks, all the details are in the description. So until next time, stay angry about space.